Okay. So today we are going to talk about artificial intelligence and the news. And to help us with that, we have David Yanofsky, who is a reporter for Quartz, where he covers topics ranging from trade and agriculture to tourism and satellites. A self-taught practitioner of JavaScript, processing Python and R, he previously worked for Bloomberg, creating interactive stories for its websites, television stations, radio broadcasts, and magazines. He is the initi initiator of the Chart Builder Project at Quartz and is currently suing the US government. So welcome, David, mm -hmm. and we're eager to hear more about all of this. Sure, thank thanks. You. Um, uh, thank you, uh, thanks to all of you for, for Okay, well, um, but for my, uh, the microphone messing up my comedic timing, thank you all for paying tuition and showing up today. Um, uh, so, uh, just a little bit about Quartz, if you're not familiar, um, we are a global business news publication. Um, we were founded five years ago uh, to kind of be the, you know, we. In our welcome letter, letter, we talk about the, what the FT was at the turn of the century, what, um, uh, what the Wall Street Journal um, was a little bit later, what The Economist was, what Fortune was. We want to be that for the um, 21st century. And um, obviously, that, that means being only on the internet. And uh, it means taking advantage of all sorts of technology to, um, to further um, our reporting. and, and um, and also in the, in the way that the 21st century uh, kind of uh, rewards openness and sharing. We're, we're a big believer in uh, openness and sharing of our um, journalism, whether it be um, creating software tools like Chart Builder um, and giving it to uh, open sourcing it and letting anyone um, use this tool, which allows the simple creation of good looking uh, charts um, uh, to creating um, as I'll show you today, some bots that, we are, that we've open sourced and, um, yeah. Um, uh, so this is Quartz website. Um, this is a story that I published maybe an hour ago. Um, and uh, in recent years, as, or in recent months even, as, uh, you know, things have gotten easier and, and more attention and, and interest has developed around this, we have been um, exploring ways to use um, artificial intelligence. Um, uh, one of our first experiments with it, um, I guess one of our first experiments was, was actually um, at a conference that we had. We had this Next Billion conference, which is uh, a conference about the, uh, the, when we first did our first one three years ago, four years ago, it was about the next billion people to gain internet access around the world. Many of them, many of those people have, have already gained uh, internet access since then. But uh, this is our conference and, and uh, we had a Slack bot during this conference that an, anyone at the conference could be a part of, could join this Slack organization of conference attendees and we had a bot that would, um, that would answer any questions that they had. When certain sessions were, where the bathroom was, anything uh, like that. And then we have kind of continued and iterating, uh, continued iterating on that. Um, this was, a, in fact, one on Twitter um, for uh, the NICAR conference uh, last year. Um, same sort of thing, but this was, this was more open for other people uh, in the news business. If you don't know, NICAR is the invest, uh, investigative reporters and editors kind of uh, computer-assisted reporting conference. Um, so a lot of uh, news coders um, are there and had some affinity for um, this thing. Um, another thing that, that we've done um, on the sillier side is uh, 
analyzing the New York City dog registry to create uh, fake names for dogs. Um, uh, where we came up with these. N no dog in New York City is named any of these things, uh, but they are seemingly uh, normal, uh, oops, yeah, normal uh, dog names. You could imagine a dog named Dewey or Bunsi, Cramp, Dango, Ray Bella. Surprised that that one is not actually uh, someone named that. Bum, Bum Charmo. Um, but then, of course, th there's you know the, the the first uses of artificial intelligence and news and kind of and deep learning. Um, it, it has more been found on on a website like BuzzFeed, and has been kind of ancillary to the journalistic tasks. It's been you know they websites like BuzzFeed um, and others use very sophisticated. Uh, computer uh, uh, learning or machine, machine learning and, and artificial intelligence to determine what should go here. Um, well, you know, they, they are in the business, or we're all in the business, I guess, of keeping people on to reading more and more of our stuff, um, BuzzFeed especially. Um, and so making sure that all of these things relate to this in a way that, you know, that is most likely for someone to click on it next. And it's um, you know why? You know if what, they can, you you see one you see you read one story about the seven things about growing up in the '90s, and then uh, you look at that sidebar, and it's other things that are like of that genre. Um, and some of that is just like simple tagging and matching, and some of that is um, cookieing users and understanding um, what what they are most likely to click on next. Um, and then, of course, there's, there's the type of machine learning that um, uh, I th many people uh, in journalism schools are um, terrified of. Uh, I am not, but uh, it's this. This is uh, a Q4 earnings report for Gray Television, um, which, as you can see, was this story was auto-generated by Auto Insights. And all it does is suck in the financial reporting of a company and spit out a a uh, story that s five years ago was written by some very low level person at the AP or at Bloomberg or at Reuters or whatever. Um, this is, you know, this, this, this can be done with sports stories. Uh, this can be done um, with earthquakes, um, as the LA Times does. Um, this is. You can see that the byline on this is QuakeBot, um, and it's, uh, you know, it's, that's, the, that's the extent of the story, but it tells you everything you need to know about a 3.8 earthquake, which is forgettable already. Um, uh, but it's there, and it's, and it's put out uh, nearly immediately. This, the QuakeBot was created by this guy, Ken Schwenke, who's now at ProPublica. Um, he has written a blog post about how this whole thing came about and, um, and, and how it works. They, they beat, I can't remember why, why that blog post was written, but they were, they were able to very, very quickly put up a story about an earthquake um, in the middle of the night, and it's because his phone buzzes when QuakeBot wants to publish a story, or it did when he was there. Um, so his phone buzzed, he looked at it, he pinged the editor that was, that was on duty and they put up the story and like between his phone buzzing and that happening, it was like five minutes. And they had, they had whatever this is, a hundred word story about an earthquake, um, which in that case was, was later amended and edited and got human bylines on it as well. Um, uh, but you know, it, 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 got, it got the story up. And in this case, it just stayed as this. Story, uh, news organizations are also using um, AI in, uh, to deal with their archives, um, uh, using machine learning and computer vision to, uh, at, at its most basic, you can, you can just see what happens when you put your mouse over, over something, um, where besides the just kind of computers reading the text, it also knows where the edges of the story is. Um, and uh, I'm sure that some of this was uh, just in the way that 
machine learning typically works is, is, I don't know about this specifically, but some human had to go in and, and on some of these pages had to draw boxes around where, um, where the story was, what, what constituted the same story. And then they put through, you know, thousands and thousands of pages um, into, an, uh, into an algorithm that said what, what on these pages is like those. Um, and they're able to create this thing where you can, you know, click on it and you get metadata information about it. Um, and you can, uh, obviously you can search through the whole archive and find stuff and um, really incredible um, thing. Is this from today? Yeah, this is from today, from this, this day in history, 1918. Um, there's also, kind of this, this intersection of other people doing all sorts of artificial intelligence to aid in news organizations doing um, artificial intelligence um, and not so much in the financial relationship like, like you see in uh, Automated Insights as it was written here, um, uh, but more as you know, AI as a platform, um, understanding um, not only human speech, uh, when you're when you're talking to a device and having having a news app being able to use that interface and and uh, and basically getting that AI for free, but also being able these devices often um, often now and even more so into the future will have to understand your a person's intent um, and what what someone you know how many different ways you can say one thing and being able to uh, rationalize that in a way that a news organization can use and and further uh, a user experience, not unlike a news organization is building a, an app on their phone, uh, on a phone and needs to understand the ways in which someone can touch something and what that means. Um, the news organization is not, not you know, sensing where on the screen, like what it means when an electrical signal um, is sent because your finger touches a capacitive piece of glass. Um, it, just knows, it just gets a signal from the operating system that says, uh, uh, you know, there is a touch here. So in the same way, um, these devices are, are using artificial intelligence to say this is what this person wants to do. Um, there are, um, oh, that was, we can close that. Um, there's Klaxon, um, which is not explicitly uh, machine learning or artificial intelligence, but does show the, um, uh, the hooks at which you can apply it. Um, this is simply a messaging platform um, and using artificial intelligence to uh, message reporters and alert reporters um, to things as they happen um, it is a great opportunity um, for artificial intelligence going into the future. Um, and there's, there's a number of, of different ways uh, which people are doing that. We at Quartz are doing um, that with uh, a piece of software uh, called Quackbot, um, which um, besides being able to just do pre-programmed tasks, um, I, can, I can Slack Quackbot um, uh, a PDF and it will automatically put it on, it will, it will put it on Document Cloud, a, a PDF hosting site, and it will give me back the link to that. And so instead of me having to log into Document Cloud and uh, uh, upload the thing and wait, wait for something to happen and copy the link and put it in my story, I just do it in where I, where I live most of my day, which is in Slack, where I'm communicating with my colleagues and everything. I guess the one thing I didn't say, I'm based in Palo Alto. Um, I, work, I work remotely. Um, and uh, uh, prior to that, uh, I was in New York. But anyway, uh, Quackbot. Uh, so other things uh, Quackbot can do is like Klaxon. It can, it can alert you when, um, when websites change. And, and one of the things that, we're, that we are building into it is this is a machine learning artificial intelligence thing where um, it can learn that um, if, if the thing that changed on a, if, if you get shown a screenshot of a web page and say, look, it changed, and it, Quackbot can then say, is this change interesting? And then we just keep on, we can learn on whether that change is interesting or not just for that website. So that the next time that you get a, a screenshot from Quackbot about whether something has changed, um, it won't be the same. If you didn't think the last thing was interesting, it won't be that again. Um, one, of the, one of the most common use cases for that is an ad changes, or there's a slight design change on, the web, on a web page. Um, all of those things are not 
inherently or typically not the thing that a reporter is looking for when they're when they're looking for that newsworthy change. Um, and then uh, uh, then getting into the m even more intense stuff, we see what ProPublica is doing right now um, with their um, uh, this this whole kind of information app about uh, about the United States Congress, um, which is called Represent. And besides it showing every Congress member of Congress's votes um, and statistics about that, um, is this is this nerd box right here, which um, uses, which its simplicity belies uh, the, the complexity behind it. Um, they, ProPublica analyzed every press release that, that they could get their hands on for every member of Congress and was able to deduce from that using machine learning techniques which um, what topics this each member of Congress was uh, had a was a what what were their policy priorities? Um, so we can see NSU who I don't know if she, does she represent Stanford? Do we know? She's her office is in Palo Alto. There's a weird cut in the congressional district that's right around here. So I don't know if, if <laughs> yeah okay. So she does represent Stanford, um, and um, and we can see um, as as a as you might expect from someone from Silicon Valley, uh, is interested in science and technology, um, international affairs a little less uh, so. But um, uh, it also, um, more, more importantly, uh, it, using the same machine learning techniques, you can look at um, topics that are distinctively them. You know, what are, what are the topics that they talk about that are unlike any other topic that any other member of Congress is talking about. Um, and it would make sense that she would be talking about Santa Cruz or uh, something about SFO. Um, aircraft noise, similarly, Palo Alto. Um, you know, fire, uh, uh, seemingly fire rescue um, with their, their rescue wing or fire uh, fighting by air, the rescue wing in um, Santa Clara. Um, uh, so this is, this is something that they, you know, go into in a lot of detail um, here and uh, it's kind of the type of the type of thing that um, I think is much mu much more of this type of thing is is kind of the the medium term and short term future of uh, artificial intelligence and news than the like BuzzFeed this is what you should read next um, uh, but that's not to say uh, that Kind of going a little out of order. We'll get back. We'll get. Remember that thought. Uh, the Atlantic put out this Trump or not uh, bot, um, which is uh, pretty interesting in uh, using using machine learning techniques to um, up guess um, or to to analyze every tweet that the president uh, sends out and determine whether it was sent by him or one of his aides. Um, and uh, that was based on this. Uh, looking at looking at all of his tweets before he had aides writing his tweets, and then seeing which are the most um, similar to those, um, which uh, is a very newsworthy um, thing, right? You well, you know, here we're saying, oh, it's only 52% chance that it was written, but here we have 99% chance it was written by him himself. Um, Putting Pelosi, Schumer, liberal puppet Jones into office in Alabama would hurt the great Republican agenda on, of low on taxes, tough on crime, strong on borders, and so much more. Look at your 401k since election, highest stock market ever. Job, uh, jobs are roaring back. Maybe you didn't need machine learning to understand that like that type of cadence was, was from the president, but uh, there you have it. Uh, but maybe that, maybe that helps you trust uh, this algorithm even more. Um, so, uh, like I was saying, like BuzzFeed does, BuzzFeed also uses machine learning at the total other end of the spectrum. Um, with this, they, as they showed with this story, Spies in the Skies, which they were able to find uh, many, 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 many um, government uh, or flights by government, uh, government surveillance flights, uh, whether it be the FBI um, or the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, 
operating, flying little airplanes um, or helicopters or whatever over certain locations, um, presumably with monitoring devices on them, um, and uh, hopefully only to track uh, criminals uh, uh, and not to for bad uh, anti-civil reasons. Um, but anyway, the, the way that they did this was uh, was training um, uh, was training a computer on uh, what what uh, suspected what these flight paths looked like. Um, as you could see, um, as you could see here, you know, you often see these circular patterns of flights of, of planes flying around a specific point of interest. Um, you can see sometimes uh, in this situation, you, you can, uh, it seemingly shows an airplane following a car driving, um, what is that, the San Mateo Bridge. Um, uh, and then and then ending up somewhere in I don't know somewhere near Redwood City. Um, so uh, being able to f f they took uh, as described here they took uh, examples of those that they knew were surveillance flights and they and they created a database of them and then they were able to work with uh, I can't remember if it was flight radar or or um, flight aware, one of the one of the big kind of aircraft tracking websites, um, uh, and they were able to work with them to run uh, uh, artificial intelligence over the flights of uh, over the flight paths of like every aircraft that these websites had um, uh, had been had tracked um, in recent months and years, and. Uh, pick out the ones that, that looked the most like those. And they were able to discover not only just like how many of these flights existed, but also the registrations of these airplanes. These, these, you, the FBI, when they're flying these airplanes, don't have, um, when you look up their tail numbers, they don't say Federal Bureau of Investigation. They say they have all sorts of um, effectively shell companies um, that, uh, these, that these planes are, are registered to, um, to further obscure um, their purpose. Um, it also exposed uh, contractors that were in the business of helping um, uh, the law enforcement with these um, uh, with these actions. And um, BuzzFeed has actually probably has used these these two tech uh, this data and this technique to find even um, more interesting stories about who is flying, what types of planes, and where. Um, uh, around, I think even around the world. I don't even think it's, it's just US focused. Um, there's the Overview Project, um, which is a long-standing project um, that was originated at the AP um, that uh, um, you throw at it. You, you have a big dump of documents, and you shove it into the Overview Project, and it will, it will read them. It will, one, it will scan, it will scan if you, they're not actual uh, uh, text or computer readable documents. It will scan them, turn them into computer readable documents, um, and uh, be able to cluster them based on subject matter. Um, and the uh, I'm I'm pretty sure that the uh, Iraqi war logs um, used overview to be able to cluster um, documents about explosions versus documents about transports versus doc and see how many of these and and look at the interactions of those types of uh, events. Um, the uh, LA Times um, is, the LA Times reported, reported out a story, um, uh, an incredible story. They, they noticed that, um, that crime rates um, in the city of Los Angeles were dropping um, and uh, there didn't seem to be an explanation why, um, and they were able to look at, they, they filed a public records request for all of the, um, I don't even, I, I forget how, what their specific name is, but basically when a, when a, when a police officer uh, shows up at a crime scene and files a report, there's like a little, there's like a little like kind of first, um, so it might not even be first. In the police reports, there's a description of what happened. And they used uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, 
to look at those words and compare them with how the crime was categorized. And uh, what they found was that um, it's not that these types of crimes were going down, it's that the categorization had changed. That the likelihood that, that um, uh, you know, I think they used an example uh, of like how many times the word stabbed uh, or, you know, so-and-so was stabbed or was it stabbed and injured in the, same, um, in the same report, they were able to determine that like in, uh, in the past that would always be categorized as a violent crime and now it was like only 20% likely to, that it was a violent crime or something, something some, some decrease like that, I'm making up those numbers. Um, uh, but you, being able to use AI to augment um, uh, that story was almost the only way to do it. Um, next to reading every single one of these reports, um, which wouldn't have a, just you could do, but you the paper the paper would be dead at this point because they'd have all the reporters reading police reports. Um, oh, so uh, and then the most intense type of AI that we're seeing in news today um, beyond, you know, going through all the way from the predictive autolytics to the automation um, at scale to the conversational interfaces and, and tools to assisting your one-off stories um, is the investigating the black box. And ProPublica has been doing a lot of this and they've been doing it really well. Um, and this story is about um, how uh, car insurance premiums in non-white areas were higher than uh, in white areas and the only way that ProPublica figured this out was that um, they didn't know, they did not know how car insurance companies were calculating um, the premiums. But they were able to look at the demographics of the area um, which is, you know, and, and uh, all of the statistics about areas that, that, it, that the insurance companies would obviously be using. It's the only way uh, to make insurance premiums is to look at that demographic data. And then they were looking at the output. They were looking at what people in these neighborhoods were being charged. Um, and they were able to show, um, it's a great chart in here. Um, uh, they were, they're able to show, so that, so a Geico, you can just see how um, the liabil liability premium, as it's, as it's known, in minority neighborhoods greatly exceeded that um, in uh, white neighborhoods. And that, um, and this is, this is a, a scatter plot based on the, the, how much people are paying versus the actual risk um, of, uh, of each area. So, um, you know, for the same amount of risk, um, a white person was paying uh, about, what's that, 40 bucks, 40 bucks less uh, per month. Um, and you saw that, um, you know, that they, I think they got a number of providers in here. Um, and so, like, in, in, in terms of, like, the biggest, uh, like I said, this is the, this is definitely like the biggest investigative in, investigative uh, opportunity um, is doing things like this, um, and the um, uh, as well as uh, n just just above the the biggest day to day opportunity, which is stories like uh, this, we're helping you on a single a single like I only say that because the um, this story can be run this story can can be like ongoing. They can continue. There's, there, they can do this on such a much larger scale um, than uh, than the than the police can, and also the police thing. You have you have every step along the way. You have the input, you have the algorithm, and you have um, the output, which is the crime rate. And this um, you don't have that middle piece, but both can use um, artificial intelligence for that. Um, and so I guess in that regard. Um, you know, so often the conversation around artificial intelligence and news is about um, this. It is about the, the, the computers are going to take our jobs. Um, but I think the reality of it is really, is really this and this, where um, 
artificial intelligence, while it will, while it will definitely take, take some people's jobs, I mean, some people's jobs, but, but did anyone ever want to be writing this in the first place? <laughs> like, this is, this is people, like, people who are going to journalism school, people who are switching careers and becoming journalists are wanting to do public accountability. Um, and they're, they want to find scoops. They don't want to, they don't, they don't want to just like re-recite financial um, reporting uh, so that uh, to prevent some like medium-sized investor from having to dig through the documents themselves. Because that's all this is. It's just like, this is like a convenient service for like a s small to medium or retail investor. Um, Although the Enron story started off as a simple vanilla earning story. The, the, there are definitely, definitely examples of the simple vanilla uh, story leading to bigger things. I've had my, some, I wouldn't say, uh, my, more than my fair share of those. Um, but uh, yeah, if any of you are concerned about AI taking your jobs, I think uh, you shouldn't be. Um, anyway, uh, if you guys have any questions, I'd love to take them. Or Anne, okay. if you have any. So uh, let's see, Brandon and uh, Danny, you guys going to kick, kick off the conversation? I mean, what, uh, so one question I have here is, is more of on, along the lines of business. How, how, much, um, how much do you think this is going to be beneficial to your dis you know, distressed industry here in terms of efficiencies of, of scale, economies of scale, um, in helping uh, reduce the costs of, of producing these kinds of big stories? Um, so reducing the cost of the big story is a hard thing to understand. I think the way that I always think about it is more um, the way that some people understand traffic, um, which is this is the uh, when there's big when there's a lot of traffic in a metro area. The common response is we should build more wider freeways. Um, um, but really what ends up happening is that the capacity of the freeway just gets filled up. Um, and the thing, that, the thing that's most evident about that is, is that the United States has done a lot of road building in recent decades. And the average commute time of an American is still 30 minutes. It's been 30 minutes for forever. And it, and it says something just about people's willingness to undertake a certain thing, this commute. And so if I think about it in the way of the news, it's like, well... The cost of an investigation is whatever. Some places it's $100,000, some places it's $1,000. But um, the ability to take on more and more complex um, investigations for that money is really where this, is, is where I think AI comes in. Just because it is, you can have such an efficiency gain and you can do so much more complex um, uh, analyses um, on smaller and smaller teams. So, in the sense that does that help? Um, in one regard, yeah, because you're getting more efficiency from your reporters. Uh, but in another regard, no, because you're still spending the same amount of money. Um, so it just it just depends on like the economics of of you know the economics. This will be great for the economics of some organizations, and it won't be um, for um, others. That being said, being able to augment any reporter with um, tools and technologies that allow them to do better reporting is I think will always be better for business. Um, you know, uh, that was that was in fact one of the uh, that was a, a starting premise of Chart Builder, which was if we can get non-graphics trained journalists to be able to make their own charts, one our our stuff will be better because we'll be because more the the capacity of the graphics desk is no longer the 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 limiting factor of whether your story gets a chart or not. Um, uh, but also it opens up that, that graphics desk to be doing more interesting work and more um, in-depth and impactful work rather than just making line charts all day. Is there work being done today? Like 
go beyond just the technical reporting, like the technical automated reporting, and going into like automated creative work? Uh, meaning? Meaning like, I don't know, like fictional stories or like oh, yeah. human videos. Yeah, there's definitely, there's definitely work being done of people trying to create, well, the history of algorithmic art goes back like yeah. decades. Like that's not, that's not anything new. Um, and it, it hasn't supplanted, like even, even before computers could do it, um, uh, I know this because, uh, not only because you know, knowing about culture is a good thing, but also I, I, I went to art school. I didn't, I didn't go to uh, uh, journalism school or anything. So uh, Maya Lin, uh, excuse me, not Maya Lin, uh, uh, Yoko Ono and uh, Saul LeWitt, uh, um, to conceptual artists, the whole conceptual art movement is, is in a way algorithmic um, in which, you know, Yoko Ono gives you a card at a gallery and you read it out loud and it's like, she didn't, she created the system, right? Saul LeWitt says, take a wall that's at least this big and draw diagonal lines on it. Now have five different people draw uh, squ uh, squiggly lines with, with blue markers. Algorithmic, a computer, like you could com program a computer to do that, but, but he was programming humans to do that. Um, uh, but in terms of like more directly now what you're talking about, there are definitely um, uh, people working on creating, you know, algorithmic poetry, algorithmic um, fiction. Uh, it's all seemingly created as its own genre. Um, no one's trying to like write a novel and be like, be like, this is, you should like this as, it, as a novel rather than as a, a AI created novel. It's kind of like a, as, as, as I've always seen it, I'm not as well versed in that as I am in other things. But yeah, yeah, question? Yeah, um, so I'm just interested in your experience, your self-taught. Mm -hmm. Because um, um, Lots of help. Coding journalist. Yeah. Coding journalist. Well, uh, from past speakers and also other, People uh, talk, and it, it seems that nowadays it's it's that journalists have to learn coding to do stories, amazing projects like that. Um, and I was wondering um, if there's any other way where you know journalists can better identify um, engineers and um, developers to to collaborate instead of them starting from scratch to mm -hmm. do stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so, uh, you know, self-taught self always, when anyone says it, is always uh, a, bit of, a bit of a mischaracterization. Um, I, I never took any classes on coding, but, like, I sat next to lots of people. Like, I was, I was sitting at my desk trying to figure things out, and the person next to me, you know, knew a little bit more than me, and the person behind me knew a little bit more than him. And it was like, um, so, you know, saying you're self-taught is just saying you're learning from everyone. Um, uh, and in that sense, in a newsroom, there's lots of people with many different skills, and um, you know there are many people uh, that I've worked with that are way better at sourcing than I am. Right? They can't they can't code one line, but they can they can set up a breakfast, lunch, dinner, drink, and late night drink with um, anyone in the industry that they want, and do it six days a week, and and generate stories that they're handing off to me because. Um, because that's what they're good at and, and I'm here doing what I'm good at. Um, uh, in terms of finding, finding those people to collaborate, hopefully they're in your newsroom. Um, uh, but if they're not, there's lots of civically minded um, coders um, and designers out there. Um, and yeah, the, this, this space of, of people coding and, and designing and um, for, for nonprofits or for government or for um, NGOs um, is full of people who are sympathetic to the journalistic cause. So I, I think this is really interesting. I mean, like, I think there are, it seems like there are a couple of categorical cases where you see things like ProPublica where um, you're tracking changes, but it seems relatively, uh, it, it seems like the, the content generally conforms to a certain style. 
So you're you're looking at the press, the press publications of like a senator, and you're just keeping track of what sorts of things they're talking about, what sorts of things mm -hmm. they're interested in. Um, and I think more interesting to me is stuff like making sense of why the crime rate seems to be declining in Los Angeles, and mm -hmm. looking at, at that sort of trend. Um, but the salient issue to me in that anecdote is that it seems like if you talk to cops, you have found out that maybe they're ultimately categorizing crimes or, or incidents differently because of some policy change. Um, and it seems like that would have been the shortcut to, to that whole story, mm -hmm. um, rather than using NLP and everything else like that to make sense of the details of the freeform comments and everything like that from, from their reports. Um, and the, I guess like, the takeaway from that seems to be that investigative reporting, like that skill of actually going and doing that, basically kind of like doing that legwork, might, it seems like it's getting lost a little bit, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how it, that aspect of things is maybe being flexed or ex like exercised in other ways, mm -hmm. like maybe technology to, sure. to do some, I, I, I don't know what exactly, like to augment that. Um, well, to Anne's point, um, and, or to the point, uh, and to the point that I was making to Anne's question, it is a cost thing, right? It's, you're, you're gonna get, uh, more bang for your buck if you're using the algorithm to to analyze all these reports instead of spending uh, three weeks walking to every uh, precinct and and trying to get someone to talk to you um, and and not and not maybe not producing anything right think about you c you c you can do that shoe leather reporting you can talk to every cop on the beat and that doesn't mean any of them are going to say anything to you um, this is this is information that is that that um, the police department was forced to give the LA Times through an information, uh, freedom of information request, and uh, they were able to analyze it immediately um, once they got it. Uh, to the point of um, uh, whether, whether, oh, and also whether, whether you're talking to someone, whether talking to a cop would have told you that or not, um, the response from, it, the very reasonable response from um, the police department would have most definitely been, oh, these are just cops in that one precinct, we're dealing with that. These are just, you, didn't, you, didn't talk to, you didn't talk to everyone. Not all cops are doing this. This isn't, you know, this is, this is an isolated incident. There's no, you like, even if you were to do that, you would still need to, you would still need more proof to get above you know, government spin, um, in, in my opinion, is, is how I view it. I think um, I, it's very easy to, uh, it's very easy to cast aside a lot of investigative reporting wrongly, but it's still easy to do as being anecdotal. Um, so being able to have um, strong and uh, strong, encompassing, hard to refute evidence um, is, 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 I think, is important to any uh, investigation. Um, journalism generally seems to be relatively open and transparent about sharing data, sharing tools, etc. Mm -hmm. But in an economically unstable time, how do you think we can incentivize organizations like Quartz to open source these tools at lower their costs to investigate journalism rather than? Yeah, I would say most, in my experience, most people, most people that are doing this type of work are like very, very much buy into the credo of like software is meant to be free um, and, and open and, um, and believe that, that um, the best you know, like you said, transparency, uh, the transparency of your code is just important of the transparency of, of your reporting, not that those are different things even, but um, to understand that your code is your reporting and it needs to be transparent. Um, so, uh, but that being said, the, the, lim the biggest limiting factor, I think, in terms of organizations opening, opening up their things is one, they don't think it's important enough or that it's reusable enough. They didn't, they created it in such a way that it was too specific for their use case. So, um, you know, finding a way to incentivize people to make general, to, to generalize their work rather than um, a, around a story and to, you know, deal with things that way um, is, is one thing because then people would be more willing to open source it. Um, and the others is, uh, 
uh, another is just the time that it takes to do it. Um, you know, if you did, if you did have a thing you want to open source it, then you need to generalize it. You need to document it, and um, uh, that that takes time, and that takes time away from reporting your next story. Uh, and then, uh, and then the one of the other one of the largest things is is you have to support it. It's hard. To, it's 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 almost disingenuous to put something out as being open. Um, publish code and put it on GitHub and say, yeah, participate. Here's how you can do it. And then someone sends you an email that says, oh, I'm having this problem. I need to, like, I need to get this thing working. What's the deal with my thing? And, and you know, then you have to make the decision of like, whether you're going to take time out of your day to um, help this other person. You know, whether you're providing something as is, um, is not a, like, provide, or providing software as is with no support is not a very generous thing to do. Um, and is perhaps even less generous than, um, than not giving to them at all because uh, you are setting them up, you are possibly setting them up to just waste their time failing with your thing that you can't help them with. Well, I was actually wondering about, um, in terms of the automatically generated stories, mm -hmm. how could be used um, somehow uh, in order to avoid like, public misinformation? In terms of like either identifying or like providing information as like false stories that are put out in other areas. Um, it's a little tough. So much, so much of the of those automated stories um, are based on very clean data sets, and so much dif disinformation is based on or both, but, but clean and regular and tabular data sets even. Whereas disinformation is, is usually based on something that's very different from that, right? It's someone said this thing at this event, which yeah, if you had the video of it, you could, you could look at that thing and you can look at, at, you could look at the whole context of what that person said and what it means and um, whatnot. But um, yeah, I'm not sure, I haven't given that much thought. But that, that's, that's the first thing that comes to my head. Okay. Why are you suing the US government? Oh, I'm suing the US government. Uh, I'm suing the US government for access to uh, the uh, records uh, when, when a non-US uh, resident enters or exit, or the non-US resident enters the United States, they're given a, a document that, or a document is created that has all of their demographic information about it, where they're coming from, what visa they're on, yada, yada, yada. Um, anyone coming into or out of the United States on an airplane, another record is generated um, about where they're going, where they're from, their demographic information. Um, and I'm suing for all of those records. Um, the, uh, is this exit entrance and exit data? If you're on an airplane, it's exit and entrance. If you're, um, if you're uh, not, it is only um, entry. And obviously, those overlap. Um, so yeah, I, I filed a Freedom of Information Act request to the uh, Department of Commerce, which collects this data and cleans it and anonymizes it, um, and, which is very important. And uh, um, actually, I don't even know what type of cleaning they do or anonymizing they do. I know they, they, they collate it and resell it. And the issue at hand in my case is whether they are allowed to charge me $175,000 for it, um, which is what, if you wanted to, could pay for it and they would give you all of this data. Um, so that's why I'm suing them. It is uh, currently pending at the uh, district court in DC, waiting for a judge to rule on it. What's that? Are you just collecting to collect it, or are you looking for something, or are you suing them because you think it's wrong? Well, I first collected it. I first asked for the request because I was just interested in it. Courts being a global business news publication, we could you know, tracking the movement of different demogra uh, different groups of people into and out of the United States has all sorts of business stories into it. Um, you know, I can think of one where uh, a uh, high-end shopping mall is built in Houston. It has certain very high-end stores are um, go in there. Now. You can just say, oh, it's because Houston has all this oil and gas money, and, um, uh, and they just want to, you know, have, they're supporting that clientele. Um, the other is, Houston has seen an increase of, of, of uh, oil and gas 
executives from the Middle East that are coming into the United States and buying luxury things for their families. And being able to, being able to say how many and, and how often is, is an important business story. Now, uh, I filed this suit under the Obama administration, um, or I filed this request under the Obama administration, and um, obviously in the last year, um, other uh, newsworthy use cases came about, which is how many people from these countries are actually coming to the United States? How many uh, people on these visas are coming into, the United, into and out of the United States? Um, things like that. And then there's also certain, there's also certain uh, information about various visa types that the government won't give you that would be, um, be, be able to imply from um, people crossing the border and the demographic information on those. Do you think that the increased use of AI in reporting is going to, how do you think it will impact the, the trust issue that's, that's currently being so vigorously debated? Um, has, you know, has crowdsourcing um, caused people to trust media less? I see the, I see the arguments about, about trusting media um, or, or trusting a, a new method in media, um, uh, the arguments against crowdsourcing, which is like a widely established practice now, um, are the same as seemingly very similar to the arguments against um, AI. Um, and the way in which we solved it with crowdsourcing is going to be the same way in which you solve it with AI, which is you just do good journalism. Like you, you understand um, the biases of your inputs. You understand. Um, the caveats, you, you are very clear about what is happening and what you know and what you don't know. Um, and if you do that, then, you know, you're, you shouldn't have any um, problems with, or you shouldn't have any more problems with trust than already exists. Yeah. Like, you do have some kind of tracker that's trying to, you know, determine what's interesting. I think there is a lot of blind trust and non-interpretability in those algorithms, mm -hmm. especially good how they are. Mm -hmm. I'm curious as to whether when a story is put into the world, whether that transparency exists is not part of the story writer and the story writer right now. Um, sorry, what was that last part? Like, does, does that transparency exist on the part of the like, journalist? Does that exist on the part of like a person who comes to the public website has no concept of word vectors and is looking at this list of um, you know surface tools or even something like the confidence, right? I think yeah. putting a, a number on confidence makes that seem like a more quantifiable thing than perhaps it really Yeah, I think uh, the most serious practitioners of AI in news right now are very aware of that and that that's because there's presently a high bar to entry. So the, the, people, the people that are into it are very sensitive to those things. How it goes into the future as tools get easier to use, yeah, there's going to be people screwing up and there's going to be problems with it just like any new technology or any new method. Um, but, you know, established practices and standards will, will come out. In terms of, in terms of uh, the transparency, um, uh, I don't know, this is a problem with, with kind of just publication in general, like how much can you, um, how, much, how much do you have to like, how big does your signpost need to be? Um, and, and how much can you expect of your reader? Um, ProPublica has a, whole, has a whole article on how it, and on how it did that and it links to it right there. Um, how many people are just going to read, not going to read that and be like, just see, oh yeah, you know, interesting policy whatevers and be like, okay, and, and be later. Like, there's going to be some that do that. Um, but, you know, that's the same, that's going to be the same thing with the QuakeBot, right? QuakeBot, you click on, you click on, the, click on the byline for QuakeBot and I think it takes you to a story that explains QuakeBot. Um, but how many people are actually clicking on that? Right? Like I feel like a lot of the controversy surrounding 
big news right now is the idea of these algorithms, even despite the many disclaimers that existed, like those disclaimers were clearly not useful. Um, the kind of information that's out there is not useful to the general public and people consuming it. And it seems like a useful trend would be to make this kind of description more accessible to the non um, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't think I have a good answer for you. Sorry, but there, it, it's, it's, it's definitely a, you know, a great um, thing to think about and a thing to, to. It's definitely something that news organizations are still iterating on, and the reason why it's still a question is because there is no answer. I think we're going to have to, we're out of time. So thank you very much, David. That was great. Thanks for having me.